This is a lecture from Open Tuition. To benefit from the lecture, you should download the free lecture notes from opentuition.com. Well, before we move on to our final section here within our chapter on groups, that final section being the existence of a chargeable gains group, well, what does it mean when different uh, companies within a group are classified as gains group members? What requirement does that place upon them and what opportunities does that give to them? Before we do that, I thought we'd just test out and revise our knowledge of groups so far, most especially in relation to our group relief of losses and in relation to the significance of related 51% group companies. That seem, might seem like a while ago now. But what I've done is to set up a familiar situation in terms of the group of companies there. We have the AV group of companies. And as when we started with this in our first lecture on this chapter, AV has two direct subsidiaries. It has 100% a wholly owned subsidiary company F and an 80% shareholding in company C. Company F then owns 90% of its own subsidiary Clarets and C owns this time 80%. You may remember our first look at this, we had 70%. We're using 80% here. We've got 80% share ownership by company C in blues. So we know what the shareholding structure is, parent company, direct and indirect subs. We would therefore be able to analyse in terms of 51% groups. What does that mean in terms of related 51% group companies? I want you to consider that issue. Then, as you can see, I've put down information about the performance of these companies, all of which have the same accounting date. And the one here is the year ended the 31st of December 2021. Where we'll see, as was the case when we dealt with group relief with these uh, particular companies, company F here is the loss maker. It has made a trading loss of some £600,000. It has other income this period. It happens to be property income, 100,000. And also, even though times are hard for it, it's a generous company. And uh, maybe surprisingly, it's made a qualifying charitable donation of 20,000 pounds. Maybe it should be registering as a charity rather than giving to one, one thinks here. But that's the information from its, or to go into its own corporate tax computation. But then we've got the other companies within the AV group all of which are profit makers. And I've given you here the TTPs, our taxable total profits. AV, as you can see up here, has got one million, all of these in thousands, by the way. That trading loss there, 600,000, which is property income, 100, qualifying charitable donations, 20,000 there. AV's TTP is one million pounds. Company C, the co-subsidiary there of company F, has a TTP of £400,000. The two indirect subs, though, so those are profit makers, Clarets with a TTP of 500 and Blues with a TTP of 350. Now, without doing any calculations there, you can see that there are more than sufficient profits available this period to absorb all of that loss. What I want you to do here having firstly established how many related 51% group companies and what is the significance of that, you may assume for this purpose that these shareholdings are unchanged since the last accounting period. They are unchanged. The percentage shareholdings you see here are exactly as they were at the end of the previous accounting period, not just those that have existed throughout this accounting period. But having dealt with the issue of related 51% group companies, I then want you to move to deal with and consider the uses of that loss of 600. I'd like you to note down there how and where that loss can be used. Now, I'm not going to give you any clues to that. You should know by now with our mix of knowledge from chapter 18, where we first got introduced to losses made by a single company. And then what we've done in this chapter where we've seen group relief being available. I want you to identify the possible uses of that loss. As we have said, there are more than sufficient profits available here to absorb all of that loss this period. 
but I want you to identify what the possible uses are. And then, given the maybe limited information available to you there, to suggest what you believe may be the best use of the loss made of 600,000, what do you think is the best use with reasons as to why? So, I'll give you, well, you can take as long as you like here, but this is going to take probably in the region of 10 minutes, I would suggest, for you to consider it, think about it properly, analyse. This clearly would be a written exercise, a section C type question, rather than, of course, an objective testing question. Identify what loss reliefs are available. Think, what are my objectives in terms of trying to get the best use out of a loss? And how may I therefore best use them in this situation in the AV group for this particular period? Over to you. When you've had your go at it, make sure you do have a go at it. Don't just immediately uh, let the, the video go through and listen to me talking about it. You need to work this for yourself. Then we'll talk about it, and having considered it, we'll then move to the final new section, as we said, in this particular lecture, and that is dealing with gains groups, for which again I trust you've done the relevant reading and review prior to this particular lecture that I mentioned to you at the end of the previous session. Over to you. OK, well, the two issues I asked you to consider here were, firstly, the number of related 51% group companies and what was the significance of there being related 51% group companies. We also then had to look at the amount of loss sustained by uh, their company F and identify what the possible uses of that loss would be. What objectives were we trying to achieve to get the best use out of that loss? And then what recommendations would we give as regards here are the possible losses? What would you recommend and why? So plenty of work to be getting on with. Firstly, then, the related 51% group companies. As we can see here, working from the top, the principal parent company, AV. AV is related firstly to company F, its 100% wholly owned subsidiary. The effective holding down to Clarets, the sub-subsidiary, an indirect sub, 100% of 90%, that exceeds 50%. So AV is also related to Clarets as well as F. Clearly, we're looking down the other side to company C. AV owns 80%, therefore those two companies are related. And then 80% of 80% down to Blues, effective 64. That again exceeds 50%. So what we know is that we have five related 51% group companies. I said to you that this situation was static from the end of the previous accounting period. And that's the date at which we take the number of related 51% group companies. But what's the significance of that? The significance, of course, is about when you pay your tax, whether or not quarterly instalment payments will be required. The one thing we don't want to do in terms of paying our corporation tax is to have to make quarterly instalment payments if that could be avoided. If you make quarterly instalment payments on a normal year-end, accounting year-end basis, then you're going to start paying the tax for this accounting period on the 14th day of the seventh month from the start of this period, just over halfway through the current accounting year-end. Whereas, you wouldn't have to pay any tax if you didn't have to make quarterly instalment payments until your normal due date, which would be nine months and one day, after the end of the accounting period. Now that is some um, nearly 15 months later than when the first quarterly instalment payment would be made. So in cash flow terms, this is an important issue. Now, how do we know whether quarterly instalment payments would be required of us? That is down to looking at your profit limit. Now, the basic profit limit for a single company with a 12 month accounting period would be 1.5 million. But whereas here we are dealing with a group of companies, we must divide out that profit limit by the number of related 51% group companies, that is five. And that therefore gives us £300,000 profit limit. What do we mean by profit? We mean TTP, the figure of taxable total profit that we're used to computing at the bottom of a corporate tax computation. But then, to give us the profit figure, 
sometimes known as augmented profit, not all, again, writers refer to that term, but augmented profit, then we add to the TTP any dividends that have been received from non-subsidiary non companies there. Any dividends received from subsidiary companies are ignored for this purpose. Only dividend income from, from non-subsidiary companies would be added in. Now then, we compare that profit figure for each such company to the relevant profit limit, £300,000. And looking therefore at each of our group companies, then we can see that AV with a TTP of a million, C with a TTP of 400, Blues with a TTP of 350, Clarets with a TTP of 500, all exceed that profit limit of 300,000. So all of them may be required to make quarterly instalment payments. To have made quarterly or to have been required to make quarterly instalment payments for this accounting period, the year ending December 21, each company in turn would have to have also been large in the previous period. If it was not large in the year ending December 20, then it wouldn't have to make quarterly instalment payments for the year ended December 21, whatever level of profits it has. If you are, of course, large this period, then that means, irrespective of what happened in the previous period, if you then estimate your large for the next period, so the year ended 31st of December 22, if you're large in year ended December 21, estimating large for year ended December 22, then for the year ended December 22, notwithstanding what happened in 2021, you're going to have to make quarterly instalment payments. That you don't want to do. So it looks like all four of the, the profit making companies, shall we call them, with the uh, TTPs as given there, AV, C, Blues and Clarets, they're all large. Therefore, we would have to make quarterly instalment payments. We should already have made them for this period if we had been large in the year ended 31st of December 20. Irrespective of what happened in year ended December 20, if they're large as they are now in the year ended December 21, and they estimate that the profits for the year ended December 22 will also be large, then for the year ended December 22, then quarterly instalment payments will be required. So far as company F is concerned, yes, it's a loss maker, but its corporation tax computation will still be showing a profit because the £600,000 loss is a nil assessment on its corporate tax comp. It has other income of 100000 donations of 20. It therefore has, prior to any loss relief claims being made, a TTP of 80. Now that is a lot less than 300. So if I tell you that the only dividends received by F were from its subsidiary there, Clarets, then those are not added in to give you augmented profit, profits here, for this purpose. And therefore, it is a small company. It is not a large company. It therefore will not be required to have made quarterly instalment payments for this period, nor will it be required to make them for the next period. But the other four companies, yes, they may have had to have made quarterly instalment payments for the year ended December 21. And if they estimate large for the next year, then for the year ending December 22, they will have to make quarterly instalment payments. So that's the significance of related 51% group companies. And that's going to impact, which is why I asked you to do it first, with the possible uses of the loss made by company F, the trading loss there of 600,000, and the objectives that we strive to achieve. So looking at our loss, therefore, we've got a trading loss of 600,000 pounds. We'll define the possibilities in a moment's time, but let's have a little look and a reminder of what the objectives are. Given that we only, we in our syllabus, are only looking at a tax rate that has been applicable both now and in the last few years of 19%, then which accounting period in which you use a loss 
is not going to impact on the amount of tax saving. The tax saving is at 19%, whether you use that loss in the current period, the previous period, or in a future period. We're just looking at a constant 19% there. So that would mean that if we, in terms of the application of the loss, if it isn't going to impact on the amount of tax that we pay, then we would like to get the relief as soon as possible. So one objective in terms of achieving better cash flow was relief at the earliest available opportunity. A further issue was that any claims within the uh, single company as a current period claim or carry back claim are both against total profits. And that's before the deduction of the qualifying charitable donations. So a second objective to relief at earliest available opportunity is avoid wasting the qualifying charitable donations. And the third and potentially most important one in this example is avoid making quarterly instalment payments. So we want relief at the earliest available opportunity. We want to avoid wasting qualifying charitable donations and we would like to avoid making quarterly instalment payments. Now, if you're thinking I'm talking you through this quite quickly and you haven't got time to write it down, there shouldn't be any need to write it down. The reason being, you should already know it. <sighs> Sounds a bit harsh, doesn't it? Well, why am I saying that? Let's have a little look at chapter 18, where we first got introduced to a single company and it having tax adjusted losses. And there on that first page of chapter 18 is what we've just been talking about. Factors to consider when choosing which loss reliefs to claim will include cash flow benefit of achieving relief at the earliest available opportunity, avoid wasting any qualifying charitable deductions and reducing profits below the profit limit or at least to the profit limit to avoid making quarterly instalment payments. We knew this. Those are the objectives that we strive to achieve. If you didn't just remember it, make sure going forward you do remember that. So looking at what we have got, if we just look at company F to begin with and what it can do with its own loss, this period without any loss relief claim, it has a TTP of 80,000. So it'll pay tax on that at 19% as all the other companies will pay tax at 19%, as we've just said. What would the current period claim be? So would the current period claim to set off that loss of 100,000 against the profits of the current period, would that be a claim of £80,000? Well, I hope you're shaking your head negatively at this point. No, it wouldn't, because the current period claim is against total profits. Total profits here is simply the, prop the property income. Total profits are before the deduction of qualifying charitable donations. Hence, one of the objectives we just laid down, try to avoid wasting them. So a current period claim would mean of the £600,000 loss made, you'd have to use 100000 to entirely eliminate the £100,000 property income, which is your total profit figure. That would leave the donations wasted, unused. They could not be brought into a separate group relief claim. Yes, we know excess qualifying charitable donations can be used in a group relief claim, but there aren't any here. That 20 is more than absorbed by the total profit to give you TTP of 80. You cannot create excess qualifying charitable donations by the use of another relief, i.e. this current period claim removes, it has to be, there is no other choice, a 600,000 loss, no partial claims in the current period, that would mean you use 100. That therefore will leave a wasted and unused £20,000 of donations. What it would do, however, is to then open up the ability to carry back the remaining 500,000. You've used 100, there's 500,000 left. We would therefore need to know what was F's TTP and indeed total profit, because that would be the target figure for the year ended. Well, this was year ended December 21. So for the year ended 31st of December 20 there. Now, the benefit, of course, of carrying back is 
by now we will already have paid that tax and on that basis it will get a repayment. Usually any relief in the current period simply avoids or reduces a future payment. Not true of course if we're talking about making quarterly instalment payments because if you make quarterly instalment payments through the period by the time you get to the end of the period you agree the loss and you come to make your claim. If you use it in the current period that will reduce those quarterly instalment payments. Payments that you would already have made so you get your money back. It's all about cash flow here, getting your money back. So those claims are all better than carrying forward. The only benefit of a company carrying forward its loss, again against total profits, is that unlike with current period claim and carry back claim, where no partial claims are allowed, as we've just seen for the current period, then when you carry forward against future total profits, then you can limit the claim so as to avoid wasting any future qualifying charitable donations. But we here do not know the numbers for the year ended December 20, nor what we're projecting for the future. And there'd be no reason to carry forward any of that loss anyway, because there's more than sufficient profits available within the group with group relief claims to get the relief now without wasting any qualifying charitable donations. Okay, so yes, current period possible, current period claim, it would have to be 100, 500 able to carry back, benefit, getting a repayment of tax, better than simply carrying forward, when it would simply reduce what would be future tax payments. Compared to group relief. Now, where can we group relieve? Where are we within a 75% group? Right, AV, and of course we discussed this at the time that we got introduced to group relief, so I hope you remember. We know that the main AV group of companies is made up of AV, company F, the loss maker itself, the co-subsidiary, company C, there's an 80% ownership there, so they're all in the 75% group. F owns 90% of Clarets, and therefore, sorry, as Clarets is also eligible for group relief here. Not just if F made a loss, but if, say, A, V or C made a loss as well. But F is the loss maker. So it could relieve against Clarets. The question then is about Blues. Could we group relief against that figure of profit there? And what is the answer to that? No, we can't. Yes, we have 80%, 80% ownership. That satisfies the 75% provision. But for group relief of losses, we need effective 75%. And when we get down to blues, 80% of 80% would equal 64 so we do not have the effective 75% link back from blues to the AV group. Therefore, we can't connect it for group relief purposes with company F. So the possibilities for F's loss, therefore, is AV, C and Clarence. AV is clearly a large company. We could use all of the 600,000 there and all of it will save tax again now at 19%. C has a TTP of 400. It is a large company, but only just. It's rather closer there to the profit limit. I'll remind you, £300,000. TTP would have been, sorry, Blue's TTP would have been nice to be able to attack as it was even closer to the 300000 profit limit but we can't do it, it's not in the same group for purposes of group relief. Clarets is, it's got a profit of £500,000. So, there's more than enough profit, there's a million in AV, 400,000 in C, 500,000 in Clarets, we've got a 600,000 loss, we're spoiled for choice. We have more than sufficient loss to, sorry, more than sufficient profits available with potential group relief claims to absorb that loss. What is the loss eligible for group relief? It's 600,000. 
any amount of current period trading loss is eligible for group relief. So where do we put it? Does it matter where we put it? Yes, it does, because although it's in the same accounting period, and although here there's no danger of wasting qualifying charitable donations, we do have an issue about that third objective we listed out and about which we've discussed in the context of related 51% group companies, and that is we want to avoid making quarterly instalment payments. So we look at those companies with figures of profit closest to the profit limit of 300,000. Now that, as we know, was 350, but blues, you can't group relieve, so that's not an option. So that therefore leaves company C with a TTP of 400. We have a loss available of 600. You would want at least 100,000 pounds of that loss to go against company C. That would bring it down to 300. It therefore does not exceed the profit limit. And on that basis, it avoids C being a large company this period. And if that moves it from being large to not being large, it's a win-win. Because what it means is that not large this period, no matter if it was large in the previous period, there would have been no quarterly instalment payments due for this period. If, as will be the case by this date, the quarterly instalment payments have either all been made, which is possible, or most of them have been made, which is the reality of it, then we could get that money back. It also means that if we're not large this period, irrespective of the estimate for the next period, which may again be large, if you're not large this period, you're not large in the next period. And so if you're not large this period, irrespective of being large next period, it will not be treated as being large for purposes of quarterly instalment payments. There'd be no such quarterly instalment payments required for the year ended 31st of December 22. So at least 100 of the £600,000 loss to go against C's profit of £400,000. If again we assume here that there's no dividend income other than from its subsidiary, its TTP and its augmented profit, its profit for related 51% group company purposes, profit limit purposes, that profit figure will be the same at 400. Get it down to 300. Go lower if you wish, but at least get it down to 300. Then Claret's at 500. So we therefore want to use at least £200,000 worth of loss against Claret's profit to bring it down to the profit limit. That again will have the same effect. That's a second company. We've done it for C, now we do it for Claret's which we take from being large to not being large, avoiding quarterly instalment payments both for this period and for the next accounting period. That is very good news indeed. We can't touch blues, not in the same group. We can, of course, still make a current period claim, but that, OK, if it meant we could then carry back, carry back is a good thing in terms of cash flow, but of course, here, you'd waste the donations. And as you've already got the AV, that's a large company. And you can't change that. It's going to stay a large company for this period. Then you could group relieve the remaining 300,000 into AV. Remaining 300, yeah, we've used 100 plus 200 is 300. Out of 600, there's 300 remaining. That could go there, the remaining 300 against that 1 million. By reducing the profits of this period, it would reduce the corporate tax liability. That would mean that if we've been paying based on an estimate of 1 million, we don't know what the estimate was for this period, but it now means that we could get money back in terms of any overpayments of those quarterly instalment payments. So again, in cash flow terms, there's nothing better than an immediate payback from HMRC for tax that we have already paid. So our, again, objectives, the three we've identified there, as listed in your notes here in Chapter 18. In terms of what were the possibilities here, 
single company claim within F. The carryback was good news for cash flow, but to facilitate it, you had to waste the qualifying charitable donations of this period. That therefore was bad news. Group relief, on the other hand, offered the flexibility of using some of the loss in whichever 75% group companies you were able to so relieve it. We have looked at those companies that had profit figures as close to the profit limit of, as it was here, £300,000 as possible. And in that way, we have been able to move two companies that would otherwise have been large out of the large categorisation, removing quarterly instalment payments, not just for this year, but for the next accounting period as well. That's got to be good news. Now, these exercises are something that would only be relevant within a Section C, a constructed response question. And it's at the difficult end, shall we say, in terms of the skills that you need to have at this level. It's just the start of the skills that you need to have at advanced taxation level. But that's not for us to discuss in terms of today in this particular subject. OK, have a think about what I have said there. So pause for a moment, look at those issues, go back through if you need to before we go on any further. Because where we go to next is, as I've said, dealing with what I hope you have uh, prepared for for this lecture, the existence of the capital gains group and what that means for the group. Well, at last we get to the final section here within our chapter on groups, and this deals with chargeable gains groups. And what we'll find is it's a combination of the things that we suggested at the very outset, at the very beginning of this chapter, we would meet when dealing with groups. It's a combination of both rules and then claims and elections that are available. Rules whereby HMRC say that if you do this, then you'll do it this way. We won't give you a choice of the matter. This is a rule. And if you proceed to make that transaction, this is the way that it's dealt with for taxation purposes. And then over and above that, here are claims, elections that can be made by the taxpayer, here of course the corporate taxpayer, to obviously improve what the tax position would be. What we'll find here is that there's two such claims or elections that can be made and one rule that needs to be applied whenever we deal with a specific type of transaction, which we'll see in a couple of minutes time. First issue, though, is this is under the general heading of 75% groups. But what we're going to see is that we have a slightly different definition of what we mean by 75% groups than what we had with group relief of losses. And that comes in just one area, the area of indirect groups, indirect subsidiaries there. So what are these rules? A group consists, of course, a group, let's try and make it work, there we go. A group consists of a parent company and its 75% subsidiaries and also the 75% subsidiaries of their subsidiaries. So indirect groups each link in the chain, parent to sub, sub to sub, each link in that chain must be 75%. Now we saw that as again with group relief, but with group relief, we also had to have effective 75% control from the principal parent company down to the sub subsidiary. It had to be effective 75%. Well, that's where we see a different issue now, that the parent company need only have an effective interest of over 50% in any sub-subsidiary company, in any sub-subsidiary company. Let's have a little look at the AV group of companies. We've seen this rather a lot, of course, during the studies in this particular chapter. And the only difference here is I've reverted back to a percentage of 80% there, so far as Company C shareholding in blues is concerned. So it was the same as before. AV owns 100% of F, 80% of C. F owns 90% of Clarets. And C, in this example, at the moment anyway, owns 80% of blues. And we have to establish, well, again, the things we've already seen. 
How many related 51% group companies are there? Who may group relieve with whom? And we now look at who's in the same gains group. Once we know who is in the same gains group, we can then spend our time looking at so what? What does it mean to be a member of that group? And look at the rule that applies and look at the claims and elections that are available. Where we'll find there's nothing sinister, there's nothing difficult about what we do here. This is a whole lot simpler as an exercise as compared to dealing with the group relief of losses issue. So what have we got? A, V, F and C, obviously a 75% group relationship, so those three companies are in the same gains group. A, V through F owns 100% of F, from F to Claret's 90%, so in which case each link in the chain, that's 100%, that's 90%, each is at least 75 and 100% of 90% equals obviously 90%, and that means we have the effective 51%, more than 50. When we say 51, we mean simply more than 50% there. So Clarets is in the same gains group with the other AV gains group members. So now the question is about blues. When it was group relief of losses, you had to have from the principal parent to the indirect sub, the sub subsidiary, we had to have effective 75%, which meant that when we did 80%, of 80%, and that came to 64%, Blues was not in a group relieving group with either AV, F or Clarets. It was within its own group, little separate group for group relief with company C. But what now happens in terms of the gains group issue? Each link in the chain, 80-80, is at least 75%, and we have therefore got 64% effective, the rule now, as we have just seen, the rule now, the parent company need only have an effective interest of over 50%. 64% is well over 50%. And on that basis, therefore, we can now identify that all of the companies in the AV group, or five of them here, are in the same gains group. So that means that these rules and these claims and elections will apply to all of them. Now, again, just be a little bit careful here in terms of the way in which you interpret these rules. Now, I'm sure that you will, and I'm sure that you will find what I'm about to say very, very easy here in terms of the rules that we've just seen and the differences in terms of effective share ownership compared to group relief where we have an indirect a sub subsidiary there. But if I were to change that 80% to 70%, would Blues still be in the same gains group with the other members of the overall AV group of companies there? Would it be in the same gains group? Now, I hope at this point in time, without touching a calculator, you are giving me the answer. If you're touching a calculator or doing some mental arithmetic in your head there, then you're going to get this wrong. Because without doing any calculation, you see that that is 70%. 70% is not 75%. Each link in the chain has to be at least 75%. That's why we call it a 75% groups issue. But what many students do here is, ah, I remember that gains group issue where we had indirect subs. You only needed to have effective 50% or 51%. And what they do is, well, 70% times 80% there equals 56%. So that's OK. Blues is in the same group there with the other AV group members. Wrong. That's effective, which is why I said, if you're touching a calculator to do that calculation or you're doing it in your head, you're doing it wrong. Because that figure at 70% does not satisfy the minimum 75%. So remember, please, each link in the chain, each direct link between a parent and a sub must be a minimum 75. It was just the effective that need only exceed 50%. Here, although the effective exceeds 50%, it's 56, 
at 70%, we fail that first test. OK, so job one sorted. We know now how to recognise which companies are in the same games group. There's just one other issue. It's not likely to be in an exam question, to be honest, but groups may be established through a parent company resident anywhere in the world. Now, what that means is that if we've got AV Inc, a non-UK resident company, and then we've then got, that's got to be at least 75%, it's probably 100%, but we've got V Limited, no, not V Limited. God, what am I doing? Get my letters wrong. F Limited and C Limited here. Then these two, F and C, are UK resident. They are in the same 75% group, but it happens to be headed by a non UK resident company. It doesn't matter. Again, in the same way as when we had group relief we could see that we could have a non-UK resident parent company with two or more UK resident subsidiary companies, in which case we also had, of course, the 75% shareholding. And those UK companies were able to group believe in one another. What we have here is that F Limited and C Limited, the two UK resident companies in the same 75% group, the gains group provisions apply to F and C, not to AV, of course, but to F and C. What are these tax implications? Well, again, we mentioned briefly these at the uh, beginning of the, the chapter, but let's look at them in more detail. Group companies will transfer assets between themselves without incurring a chargeable gain or allowable loss. This will be a no gain, no loss transfer. This is the corporate equivalent to the transfers that we saw in personal tax between spouses or civil partners, where they too were no gain, no loss transfers. So here, just like with spouses and civil partners, members of the same 75% gains group will transfer assets to one another if they, of course, have chosen to transfer the ownership of the asset from one to the other. But it is a chargeable assets will be transferred on a no gain, no loss basis. Here it says will, not may. This is not a claim. It's not an election. It is a rule here. That is the way that it will be done. Now, when we saw that in personal tax for individuals, it simply meant that husband bought an asset for £20,000 it's now worth £30,000, but he transfers it to his wife. In which case, that transfers on a no gain, no loss basis. That would be a deemed value equal to the cost of the asset. We ignore what is the market value at this point, and we transfer at that cost figure. Therefore, neither gain nor loss has arisen. Now, of course, we're dealing with companies there's a new issue that comes into the calculation of at least a chargeable gain, and that's the availability of indexation allowance. So these no gain, no loss transfers will be deemed to take place at a value equal to, again, of course, the cost of the asset to the transfer or company, plus the available indexation allowance. Now, of course, the transfer that you're looking at is likely to be taking place either now in the current accounting period, whatever date that may be, or quite recently. And by that I mean post December 2017. Remember, indexation allowance runs only to December 17. So you could have in our example, uh, in terms of our gains group, remember we had gains group members where we went back to, i just get rid of that, where we, we went back to the original percentage I gave you, 80%, all of these companies were in the same gains group. So if, for example, F transferred an asset to Blues, both in the same gains group, you would want the cost to F, 
plus the indexation allowance through to December 17. So let's say the cost was, I think we'll keep the numbers simple here, £100,000. We're told that the open market value at this point, the original cost, oh, let's have a little date on that, that was, say, 2010. The open market value is now 180000 and the indexation allowance factor, remember that's the figure always given to you in an exam question where you need it, you do not work it out for yourself. It is given. It will be to three decimal places. I'll keep it simple. It's just 0 0.300. So 0 0.3 there. So on that basis, if at the date of the transfer from F to Blues, both in the same gains group, we have a value on the asset at 180. We ignore that value and it's cost plus indexation. Cost is 100,000 pounds, 100,000 pounds. Indexation allowance 0 0.3 times 100 is, of course, 30,000. Add the two together, 130,000 pounds will be the no gain, no loss transfer value. What does that mean? It means that the transfer or company, company F, by the name, no gain, no loss, the transfer or makes neither a gain nor a loss on that transfer. But what is important here is that then the base cost of the asset here within blues, again, this transfer has occurred now in the current period, or at least post December 17, the base cost, cost plus indexation allowance, £130,000. So when the transferee company then sells that asset in the future, it will have a cost of 130000 Clearly, the no gain, no loss transfer, if, as this did, took place after December 17, there'll be no further indexation allowance available when Blues subsequently sells that property to a, a third party in the future. The cost is 130000 Indexation has already gone to December 17. It's within that 130. There's no more indexation allowance on that. If the no gain, no loss transfer had been pre-December 17, you'd have indexed at the date of the no gain, no loss transfer to that date. And now if the transferee company in 2021, 2022 is disposing of that property, then we would be able to have the no gain, no loss transfer value, the equivalent to 130 here, then that figure would be available for indexation from the date of the no gain, no loss transfer, whenever that was, up to, but never of course, later that, December 2017. Here, the transfer is happening now in 2021, shall we say, or 2022, and therefore, it's 130,000 no gain, no loss transfer. And when Blues sells it in the future, the base cost is 130,000. That will be deducted from the sales proceeds to whichever third party the asset is being sold to. There'll be no further indexation allowance, and that will give you the gain. So if it was sold, for example, for uh, £230,000 in the future, Base cost 130, gain 100. Underlined, that is the chargeable gain 100,000. There's no more indexation. We've already done that. Now that, as I say, is a rule. You don't get to choose here within the group at what value for tax purposes it will be transferred. It is a no gain, no loss transfer if the transfer is between members of the same gains group. What we then have is a couple of elections that we need to know about. Again, you may recall these being mentioned at the beginning of this chapter. Group companies can make an election such that any part of a gain or loss incurred by one company, one gains group member, may be treated as arising in another company. It gives us the ability to move within the gains group, gains and losses around from one company to another. When we spoke of this earlier within the chapter, we mentioned that the primary reason for doing this was, and 
something we refer to as the matching election more recently in these lectures, we're able to match a capital gain in one company with a capital loss in another. What were we seeking to do? Avoid being taxed on a capital gain in one company while being forced, if a capital loss arose in isolation or a net capital loss arose within a, another gains group member, having to carry forward that capital loss in looking for future gains against which it could go. We could now match. And the matching election was very flexible. We could take any part of a gain or loss and deem it to have been made by the other company. That's why we didn't call it group relief of capital losses. It's not an expression we use. You can take the loss to the gain. You can take the gain or any part of it to the loss. You can match gains with losses. Now, there's more detail on that particular section in just a few minutes time. Just want to get rid of this other one because it's a very quick and easy one to deal with. And that is that if you are in a 75% gains group, then they, that is treated as one for purposes of rollover relief. So where one company sells a qualifying asset and another company, I don't know what's going on there, and another company here buys a qualifying asset, OK, got it back again. We have one company selling a qualifying asset and another company buying a qualifying asset here within the rollover relief qualifying time period. So what we said earlier on and what we repeat and see in the notes now, it doesn't have to be the same company for purposes of rollover relief selling a qualifying business asset and also being the company buying that qualifying business asset. We can have one gains group member sells, another gains group member buys. As long as this is done within the usual time period, the reinvestment takes place between 12 months before to three years after the disposal date there, then group rollover relief is available. Meaning the gain made on the sale by one gains group member can be rolled over against the base cost of the asset acquired by the different gains group member, the other gains group member there. So much more flexibility when it comes to groups and rollover relief. It doesn't have to be the same company doing both the selling and the buying. One gains group member sells and a different gains group member may buy. If it's only partial rollover relief because we fail to reinvest all the proceeds, it could be a different gains group member again that adds on within the three year period following the disposal. Another gains group member has another acquisition of a qualifying business asset which completes the full reinvestment of all of the original sales proceeds and therefore a further claim for rollover relief will be available. So that gain therefore may be rolled over. So what are the advantages of gains group membership? Obviously, as we've said, the group's capital losses can be better utilised. We don't have to leave an unused capital loss to carry forward in one group company while having a capital gain being charged to tax this period in another. We can match them. Rollover relief, as we've just seen, is available on a group wide basis. One gains group member sells, a different gains group member or members buy. But again, it must be within the same time scale of the year before to three years after the disposal date. Another issue, we've been talking there about this matching election of matching gains with losses. We might still use this election where, in fact, there are no losses. There are only gains. Why? We can move gains from one company to another. But hang on a minute. All of these companies, whatever profits they have, will be paying tax at the same rate of 19%. And they've probably all got the same accounting period end date as well, if they are in this group. So they're all going to pay at the same date. So why would you move a capital gain from one gains group member, where it would have been taxed at 19%, to another gains group member, where it'll still be taxed at 19%, and we still have that in the same accounting period. The reason being, 
And it was, of course, a very important issue when we looked at, uh, a little bit earlier indeed in this particular lecture, at group relief of losses. And it's this point. Gains may be moved to a company with insufficient profits to cover either its qualifying charitable donations or out of a company where its profits exceed the profit limits for purposes of making quarterly instalment payments and obviously moving it into a company that has a lower, a much lower figure of profit, such that even with the gain transferred into it, its figure of profit is still below the profit limit. Now, if we can remove one of our group companies from being a large company, that's very good news. It removes the requirement to make quarterly instalment payments in relation to that company. So that matching election, not just for matching a gain with a loss, though that's the usual situation you see. More interestingly, we might say, we could have two companies, uh, one with capital gains, one with not, or one with more gains and one with less gains. But one of those companies is with the inclusion of the capital gain in excess of the profit limit, making it large and therefore setting it up to make quarterly instalment payments. The other company is not large and we have got sufficient spare capacity of that profit limit in the lower profit company to move sufficient of the gain out of the higher profit company so as to bring it down to at least the profit limit, transferring that gain to the other company where you add that to that already low profit figure and it's still below in the transferee company the profit limit for that company. Therefore, one company is still not large, it's just a little bit bigger than it was, but it isn't large. Its profits do not exceed the profit limit, even with the inclusion of this transferred gain. And the company that was large has now come down to or below that profit limit, meaning that it will no longer be required to make quarterly instalment payments. Capital losses. We've been talking about these, of course. An asset does not have to be moved between group companies in order to match capital losses and gains. And again, that uh, screen has gone funny. Hold on just a moment. Let's get rid of that. Right, now we've got our note. As we have just said, an asset does not have to be moved between group companies in order to match capital losses and gains, or indeed simply to move a gain or any part of a gain, of course, from one company to another. Companies in a capital gains group can make an election, as we've seen, to deem any part of a current period uh, gain or loss made by one group member to have been made by any other gains group member. The election has to be made within two years of the end of the accounting period in which the asset is disposed of outside the group. So plenty of time for us to plan. We come to the end of the accounting period. We know exactly what uh, taxable total profits and profit figures exist within each of the group companies. We know who is large. We know who isn't large. We know what capital gains exist in companies and what capital losses exist in companies. We can now move the parts around like on a chessboard there, moving them around to get the best position so far as we are concerned. Matching gains with losses as a priority. So that means there is less profit overall to be taxed than there would otherwise have been. And then trying to ensure that any tax that has to be paid may be paid at the latest possible date, i.e. the normal rule, nine months and one day after the end of the accounting period, that we avoid having to make quarterly instalment payments there. The advantages of the election, as we just said, the two year time limit allows us to find all the information we need for the accounting period in question for each of the companies in question, and then we can make this election retrospectively. By not having to actually transfer assets, then we've got a saving in terms of both legal and administrative costs. And the election, of course, 
can be made in respect of any part of a gain or capital loss. Any part of a gain or loss, we can move. Again, those primary objectives for that uh, matching election, to match gains with losses and to move gains out of companies that would otherwise have been large and into companies where even with the inclusion of that extra profit, that extra gain, they still have profits less than the lower profit, less than the profit limit there. OK, so these are the rules that we need to know. Again, have a quick look back on that, please. And what I'd then like you to do as the final little exercise within this chapter is to have a go at example five, where discuss the elections available to the group companies and how they may best be used. I've set up a little scenario for you there for you to use your planning skills. So this isn't just a number crunch, it's a planning exercise, a much more interesting exercise. I'm sure you would agree. So over to you, see how you fare. When you go to the answer, have a quick look at it, then come back to this and I'll talk you through it and hopefully deal with any queries that you might otherwise have had. OK, let's see what we have gleaned from this. The important information is that the company Large had a TTP of £1 million and it also had an unused capital loss of 35000 Remember, capital losses can only go against gains. They cannot go against any sources of income. Smaller, on the other hand, had a TTP of 0.8 million, and that included a gain of £100,000. The important issue here is there was just the one subsidiary company smaller of the parent large there, was that the profit limit would now be £750,000 as we divide the divide rather the profit limit of 1.5 million by the two related 51% group companies that exist. So what does that mean? It means that as it stands, each of these companies with respectively TTPs of 1 million and TTP of 800,000, they exceed the 750,000 pounds and the information about smaller also given it says that uh, we're going to have even larger profits in the future. So it's going to be large in the future as well as this period. Now, what we do have available to us, of course, is a capital loss of 35,000 that currently is unused. There are no other gains within large. That's the only information we give. It's got a capital loss of 35,000 in terms of its capital transactions. And if nothing else happens, which, of course, there will be something else that happens. But that capital loss will simply be carried forward to set off against future gains there. But we've got this gain of 100,000 in the same gains group. It's only other gains group member smaller. Now, because we've got a loss that is smaller than the gain, we could, of course, move the loss to the gain or the gain or any part of that gain, presumably at least £35,000 of the gain in too large. And what does that mean? It means that we would therefore match the gain and the loss. We would use that loss, which would have the impact of reducing that gain at the moment, a taxable figure of 100 to 100 minus 35, i.e. £65,000. And at first it might seem, well, it doesn't matter whether you move the loss to the gain or £35,000 of the gain or more of the gain figure into large to match it with the loss of £35,000, you will be netting off that loss against that gain, whether you take loss to gain or gain to loss. But if we took that loss to the gain, that would still leave 65000 instead of a hundred, And it means, remember that, 800,000 we had included the 100,000 pound gain. So this will be a reduction of 35,000 on the 0.8 million. So we're going to have what would be 765,000 pounds worth of taxable total profit. The 800,000 being reduced by the 35,000 capital loss, reducing this gain from 100 down to 65. 
But 765 is still more than 750. So it's leaving still both companies as being large companies and both subject to the quarterly instalment payments. So what do we need to do and what are we allowed to do? Where we go over and above just the concept of matching again with the loss, the idea was that we could move a gain out of a company where the inclusion of the gain had created a figure of profit that exceeded the profit limit. Without that gain of 100,000, then that TTP would be down to 0.7 million pounds, i.e. less than the 0.75, the 750,000 pounds there profit limit. So you could simply recommend just transfer all of the capital gain across to the company large with the capital, sorry, to counter all of the gain to large, the company with the capital loss, in order to get a net gain of 65,000 arising within large rather than in smaller. The point was you needed to reduce that 800,000 by at least 50,000 pounds. So any figure of gain, minimum 50,000 of that gain, it could be all of the gain if you so chose, or anything between 50 and 100, move that into large. Large is already large for quarter instalment payment purposes, and it's staying that way. There's nothing else you can do about it. So in which case, we don't want to have two companies being large and having to make quarterly instalment payments next period, let alone possibly this period. We want to be able to remove, and here it is, the smaller limited company from being large this period, meaning that if it had had to make quarter instalment payments this period, those payments would be repaid as a result of this election and no quarterly instalment payments will be made next period because by removing at least 50,000 of the gain, if not the entire 100, you have brought down its figure of profit to at least 750,000, if not lower. It could go down to 700,000 pounds. So we've got that combination here in terms of you could move the loss to the gain, the gain to the loss. That would satisfy the matching election. You have now used the capital loss instead of simply having to carry it forward. You've reduced the profits of the group by 35,000, saving corporate tax at 19% there on. But look carefully at that profit limit to see whether by moving more of the gain out of that company and into the other company, that would allow you to bring that company's profit figure down to or below the profit limit here, £750,000. That it did, that is the advice that we give. And that advice, of course, you can find written there. And hopefully again, all of that is now understood by your good selves. So lots of interesting planning issues. It lends itself, of course, to a written exercise rather than just an objective testing exercise. So you could see this as part of a section C question. And again, it is a taste of what you would have to do when, if you choose to move to advanced taxation in the future. OK, that's uh, our interesting chapter of groups now dealt with. Uh, the next chapter is the admin chapter, which again, I suggest that you leave until the end and is mostly private uh, study there, self-study. And that then takes us to uh, the last uh, two technical chapters, which deal with two, the remaining two taxes that as yet we have not seen, whereby you're going to see in section B, 10 mark questions for each of these two taxes. They are in Chapter 24, Inheritance Tax, and in Chapter 25, VAT. So next up, you can obviously choose to look at whichever ones of those that you prefer to do first. But next up for us in the order of our lectures anyway, we'll be dealing with Inheritance Tax. I look forward to dealing with death with you in our next lecture together.